Oh, where to start with this debacle of a pay-per-view? Running in Vince's territory at the Nassau Coliseum, not drawing a proper crowd to cover the goddamn cost. I can't imagine how much goddamn money Jim Crock Promotions lost on this show. And running a small card, matches that were way too goddamn long, misprinting the time on the tickets. It was just a snake bit goddamn show. And then it started, and the fact that this ran opposite of the Royal Rumble, and that was on free TV, and this was something that people had to pay for. Man, it's no wonder Jim Crocker Promotions was in financial disarray by the time they were in talks with Ted Turner to buy the company. And even though the Great American Bash 88 Tour and the pay-per-view were very successful when they were drawing big crowds, they just couldn't recover quickly enough. And then we saw what happened when Ted Turner bought the company. He brought in Jim Hurd, brought in George Scott, a whole bunch of goddamn people. Man, I really wish that Jim Crocker Promotions, rest in peace, you know, rest in peace, Jim Crockett, had been able to turn the tide around, turn the ship around, and maybe not do pay-per-views like this shit. Anyway, I'm John Renton with the retro view of NWA WCW Bunkhouse Stampede 1988. Yes, this was the pay-per-view that uh, Vince McMahon tried to fuck with, and he really didn't even need to run the Royal Rumble on the same goddamn day, because this show basically was a disaster on its own. And the sad thing is, you look at the talent... And you look at the fact that, like, there was some, there was a lot of star power on this show, but here's a big reason, I mean, besides all the reasons that I mentioned right there, let's go over those in more detail. They were at the Nassau Coliseum, 15,000 seat capacity, 6,000 fans. And according to articles, you know, out there, they printed the time as 7.30 p.m. instead of 6.30 p.m. when the pay-per-view actually started. So some fans showed up, you know, at the time on the ticket, and realized that they missed half the goddamn show. And considering that the event, the venue wasn't even half full, there were some big crowd reactions, but it was like just being, you can't pipe and drape a goddamn venue that well. And, you know, something that big, you can't put the noise and funnel the noise to the goddamn ring enough. You need to have more people. If they had 10,000 people, that might have covered some more costs, but, whoo, goddamn rewatching this. It was a struggle. Check out the Royal Rumble 1988 review that I did. And I originally did do the uh, the Rumble and this pay-per-view. Humans had to be together in one video like four years ago. And it was like about 20 minutes long and I kind of just, you know, skimmed over some stuff. But now it's time to get down to the heart of the matter and focus on a bunch of bullshit because Jim Crockett Promotions was about the business and they lost a lot of business even if, even if Dusty's booking wasn't bad. Oh boy, a lot of song references. A lot, I had to uh, reference Brian Adams because why not? I think that was Brian Adams. So anyway, yeah, running in Vince's territory when they, they had run in Pittsburgh, you know, Philadelphia. They had run even as far north as Boston. Boston, they drew some big crowds, but Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, they were competitive. Washington, D.C., other areas, they were doing really well up parts of the East Coast and doing it in New York which just sounds like a goddamn, you know, recipe for an STD. Sorry to people in New York, all five of you that are watching this, but this just did not, th this was not going to compute. It was not going to work. And hearing the stories on Jim Cornette's podcast, basically, you know, because he was part of the company at the time, he, you know, kept books on this stuff. They went from, they went from like, I think Georgia two days before, to Lakeland, Florida, and then up to the pay-per-view, up to the Nassau Coliseum in New York, the day of the pay-per-view. That was a great goddamn idea. Great job routing that shit. So, yeah, this four matches on this card. They only had, like, a two-hour window, two, two-and-a-half-hour window, or whatever the fuck it was. And the thing is, is had this card had six matches, seven matches, and had they shortened up a couple matches, this might have not been as bad. Now, granted, Starcade 1987 that I recently did retro review a couple months ago had its issues, but had some good stuff. Granted, it does also have Ronnie Garvin going into the show as the NWA champion, and this one had Ric Flair as the NWA champion because he beat Ronnie Garvin to regain the title. <laughs> and, oh, God, Jesus, the freaking tickets being misprinted, dark matches, Sting and Jimmy Garvin versus the Sheep Herders. It was supposed to actually be the Rock and Roll Express versus the Sheep Herders, but due to pay disputes, likely from Jim Crockett not necessarily, you know, giving them the proper amount of money from the fan club stuff they had or whatever the rumors were. Rumor has it that the Rock and Roll Express were screwed over on money. They decided to leave. They would come back to the NWA a little bit later, but... 
Oh, Jesus Christ. You know, um, the company just, the company was just making some questionable decisions. They were running in the walls. It was supposed to be Stan Lane and Jimmy Garvin, but they scrapped that. And since Rock and Roll Express were gone, they said, Stan, you can be at the show, but we're not going to put you in the match. And they did Stan and Jimmy Garvin versus the Sheep Herders. And they could have done a couple other dark matches. They could have done a couple... I f understand they found out, okay, we got to set up the cage. We got to set up time for that. But there were two matches that had no business going as long as they did, even given the talent involved. <sighs> so JR and Bob Cottle welcome us and everything. They say that the Bunkhouse Stampede winner will win the giant boot, the giant boot that you could drink about 15 liquor bottles out of. Liquor, I barely know her, but that never stopped me before. A $500,000 grand prize. Uh-huh. Okay. So... Uh, Tony Mullet Shivani, my god, that was a glorious mullet that Tony Shivani had. He does a ring announcing, beautiful Bobby Eaton, rest in peace, beautiful Bobby Eaton, passed away, uh, last year. Very heartbreaking. I, the Jim Cornette podcast that he did as a tribute to Bobby still haunts me <laughs> because of how much, you know, uh, they meant to each other's careers and how, uh, you know, good friends they were. But Bobby Eaton took on Nikita Koloff for the TV Championship. And Nikita Koloff and Terry Taylor at Starcade 87 had a terrific goddamn match to unify the two TV Championships, the NWA and the UWF, because they had acquired the UWF. And they proceeded to do absolutely nothing with it except for the next, oh boy, the next match, oh boy. Nikita would end up um, leaving sometime later in the year because he would have, a, uh, I believe his wife at the time was dealing with Parkinson's disease or something like that dealing with some disease and he would go to care for her he would come back into wrestling after she unfortunately passed away Nikita was still motivated at this point and Eden could work with anybody and there were some good points to this the referee was also about 8,000 years old if you notice and um Cornette was yelling at ringside and everything there were boring chants because there were there was some mat work. Bobby Eaton could work with anybody, focus on the arm to stop the Russian sickle and stop the power of Nikita. And Nikita would fire up and stuff like that. And then the, uh, Eaton even took a hip toss on the concrete. We get more mat work and a lot of arm focus. Later, Cornette runs. At the, we get a time limit draw, basically. He hits the Russian sickle, Nikita does, and uh, and gets like one, two, and then they stop that. Cornette runs in. He gets, you know, scared. Eaton gets hit with the racket, but then Stan Lane runs in and they beat up Nikita and everything. And I think Nikita would end up losing it to Mike Rotunda either at the end of this month, at the end of uh, January of 88, or sometime in early February 88. Um, and Mike Rotunda was a hell of a TV champion as well and would lose it to Rick Steiner at Starcade 1988. And Rick Steiner would celebrate like he won the goddamn World Series, Super Bowl, the Grey Cup, and every goddamn championship out there rolled into one. He ran around like it was great. Um, and then Bob Cottle just always seemed like he was lost. He did, I mean, and Bob Cottle was a fine announcer. He just always seemed like he was lost. Barry Windham defended the UWF Western States Heritage Championship. That is a mouthful against the living legend Larry Zabisco with Baby Doll. I don't know why Baby Doll was referred to as a perfect 10. Apparently, everybody in the 80s was on so much goddamn cocaine they thought that, whatever that was, something that would make the mannequin in the movie Mannequin look human, was attractive. If you thought Baby Doll was attractive, that's fine. I'm not bludgeoned in the head enough to think that Baby Doll was ever attractive. But anyway, Cottle said at one point, um, <clears throat> Larry said that I've had my eye on Barry for a while and I'm not going to stop until, you know... <clears throat> I'm I'm not gonna stop, you know, until I until I'm able to pound him. I'm gonna keep pounding him and coming for him and coming for him. Lol. So, um, I don't know why this went 20 minutes. See, the Eaton Nikita match could have gone 10 minutes. They could have done a DQ, and then they could have done this, and this match could have gone 10 minutes, and you could have added a couple matches and stuff like that. You just could have done something that didn't have so many of these matches go on. Baby Doll was allowed to get in Wyndham's face or whatever. Forever, forever and a day that's never. Wyndham uses power. Larry targeted the knee forever. A lot of time targeting the knee. And then we get a ref bump at the corner. And Baby Doll hands uh, Larry the spiked heel. Boom! Right in the face. One, two, three. Even though the ref was coming to him and clearly saw what Larry did, he counted the pin anyway. Good, good job there. The refs were fucking old as hell. So, Flair took on Hawk. Well, for the NWA Championship, and this is 
presented in the most complete form possible due to original technical difficulties. And boy, this was this was easily probably the highlight of the goddamn show. Um, even though the main event had uh, some good spots, Flair could work with anybody. And he got a lot out of hockey. He bounced around like a fucking Super Bowl. He did a whole bunch of great shit. This was really, really enjoyable. Um, because Hawk was using his power, ah, you know, all that and everything. And just at, when Hawk was on, he was just great. And since Animal was going to be in the main event, they decided to give Hawk the shot. And, you know, there were Hawk chants. At one, the referee did not, you know, bother to count this low blow, apparently, because he was distracted or just old and couldn't see what was happening in front of him because he was fucking old. I'm sure the referee is a lovely person. I just don't think that he probably survived more than two days after this pay-per-view because I think he re really remembered when World War I fucking happened. <laughs> or probably the Revolutionary fucking war. So anyway, Flair, you know... Targeted him outside, bumped him into the guardrail, did a whole bunch of stuff, did a figure four spot, targeted a knee, Hawk fired up, we get another ref bump. Oh no. Flair gets busted open. We get no ref, we do get a chair involved. Dylan comes in with a chair, Hawk will not be denied, he hits a nice superplex. And then Flair hits him with a chair to cause a DQ, and then Hawk's just all, ah, you know, that kind of stuff. It was also a weak chair shot, because it was padded, but whatever. So, um, the announcers kill time while the uh, cage is set up. We get um, recaps of the Wyndham's Bisco match. You know, the worst co match on the fucking card. And then, intros for everybody for the main event. It's Luger versus Dusty versus the Warlord versus Tully Blanchard versus Animal versus Ivan Koloff versus Arn Anderson versus the Barbarian. Bunkhouse Stampede Steel Cage match. And the way to be eliminated, two ways. Through the door, you have to be thrown through the door to the floor or pushed through the door to the floor, stumble down the steps like a drunken sailor, or you go over the top of the cage and go to the floor. Okay, so it's like a, a cage battle royal. Not, <coughs> excuse me, the worst thing in the world, but seriously, this is, th this is your grand idea? I've never... <sighs> The Monkhouse matches just don't fucking translate to pay-per-view. They don't, they're fine for house show matches. And I'm and there was some blood, mother blood, blood. And there was madness and this went a while. Um, Paul Jones was outside the ring because he had a couple of his guys there. And Dylan was out there because, you know, he had, he had a couple of horsemen. And Luger just recently left the horsemen. So he was a baby face and stuff like that. And Dusty, of course, is going to win because, of course, Dusty win. Um, they pounded, um, each other relentlessly during this match is what JR said. JR being horny on Maine, even in 1988. I think that's how the kids say it. So, um, Dusty was bleeding from the arm. Ivan Koloff was the first one eliminated. Eliminations took a while. And I, everybody, here's my thing. Just stay away from climbing up the goddamn cage and you won't get eliminated. There's only one fucking door, but no, be idiots and climb up the goddamn cage. I'm going to get away from this guy. Oh shit, I got eliminated. Ivan Koloff fell down, and I was like, I think he's dead. And then I realized Ivan Koloff died, and I felt really bad for five seconds. So Animal and Warlord got eliminated, and then later Luger was battling Arn and Tully in the corner by the door, literally for about two fucking years, and then they all tum tumble out. It's Barbarian and Dusty, it's down to them. Barbarian hits the diving headbutt. Boom, 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 boom. Barbarian gets up the cage and goes over and then boom and then bionic elbow boom and then Dusty eliminates him wins the big boot in that and gets a $500,000 check if you will and that's the end of the bunkhouse stampede and the announcers kill time and we get all that and everything and my fucking goodness this pay-per-view this goddamn snake pit pay-per-view Yes, Vince McMahon fucked with Jim Crocker promotions and they probably didn't earn nearly as much pay-per-view revenue as they could have earned but to be perfectly honest, this pay-per-view was so badly received. They didn't run another one until Great American Bash 88. If they had been able to run one in April, that might have meant something. But business had just started to slack and da-da-da. And then the Great American Bash 88 tour did kick up. And they did some great business. Some great stuff. You could take a look at some of those house shows that used to be available on the WWE Network. And might be available now on The Cock. And I actually uh, retro-viewed a few of them. And the pay-per-view uh, still holds up pretty goddamn well. The thing about this pay-per-view is they needed to have two more matches. Cut down the Eaton and Koloff one. Definitely cut the uh, Wyndham and Zabisco one in half. 
because it just got to the point where they were just killing time. And then they get to the nearly 30 minute, pay, uh, you know, pay-per-view main event, which was fine at times. <clears throat> this was about on par with the Royal Rumble 88 because at least there was more wrestling and less shenanigans. Shenanigans, you, or, you know, less bullshit. You didn't have Dino Bravo doing a bench press thing for about 15 fucking years. Check out my review if you really want to hear that. You didn't have a prolonged contract signing between Andre and Hogan, even though that segment made sense. So both shows just weren't that good. They don't hold up at all. And some 34 years later, it's amazing to see how, you know, these companies would rise up, though WCW would kind of fall into a fucking pit because of bad management and everything about a year or so after this. WWE would continue to pummel them into the dirt, even with some of the bullshit that they did. So yeah, 88 was a bit of a weird year. Anyway, agree, disagree, what I said, like, share, subscribe, Twitter handle in the description. I'm John Rutland. I'll see you soon.